We're in 1 Corinthians. Let's turn to the first chapter of 1 Corinthians. We have gone through 1 Corinthians. We're now close to the end of it. We're looking at verses. Today we're looking at verses 26 through 31. And it's kind of, a, I, 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 I don't know if people really think about chosen of God this way. But I found this to be really interesting. Decided to do a doctrinal study on it. God's chosen things. Usually when we think about God's chosen, we think about people. Israel, Christians, etc. God's chosen. The word for chosen is the word theologically where you get the concept of election. But Paul uses it in the most interesting way. God's chosen things neuter now in um, I'm going to go back to verse 25 a moment and then that it, which leads into my study for today and what he's done in chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Corinthians he has pounded over and over the superiority of the wisdom of God over the wisdom of the world the theme of chapter 1 and 2 is the superiority of the wisdom of God over the wisdom of the world. And we have studied that pretty intently, verse by verse. Uh, and so I'm going to pick up verse 25 where we left off last time. Because the foolishness of God, he's r r showing contrast, the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. And of course, this is an absurdity, but the way the w wisdom of the world thing is absurd to start with. And so what, that's what he did. And then he says in verse 26, For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, and not many noble. Now watch Watch for the word God has chosen three times. Now watch this. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise of the world. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised. Then he comes to the third time. God has chosen the things that are not that he might nullify. By the way, for those who are in our Sunday service, that word nullify is kata argeo, which is used abolish or done away with in chapter 1 Corinthians 13 in our study, by the way. That he might nullify or do away with the things that are. And this is the reason, he says in verse 29, that no man should boast before God. And then he goes on to explain that. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us, Christ Jesus, who became to us, watch this now, watch four things. What, listen to me now, the word things. Watch four things that are part of the wisdom of God that God has chosen. The, he mentions four things. He, he says, he, here's the first. Who became to us Christ Jesus. You're not going to get these four things without in Christ Jesus. Who became to us the wisdom of God, number one, that's spiritual IQ. Human IQ does not under, there is no equivalent to spiritual IQ. The best, the wisdom of the world can have, the best they have is human IQ. Listen, none of it, in verse 21, none of it brings you to God. 
Remember that? None of it brings you to God. But Jesus Christ, when you believe that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, that's the gospel. Romans 1.16 says the power to save you is in the gospel. The gospel is the power of God to save everyone who believes. Therefore, we're saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves. It is a gift. We, we get the wisdom of God in our salvation package. We get the wisdom of God. Where can I get it? You cannot get the wisdom of God apart from the gospel of Christ. How do I know? Because he says, for by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. The moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ in the church age, you are baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, 27. And at the same time, you're baptized by the Holy Spirit, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, into the body of Christ called the church. With that comes one, he just mentions four of the 50 things. You get the wisdom of God. You have access to the wisdom of God. Nobody, the smartest guy, the, the smartest guy in the world doesn't have that access. The least in the kingdom of God, the least in the kingdom of God has access to the wisdom of God. The greatest in the kingdom, the greatest in the wisdom of the world can't get one iota of it. It only comes through faith in Christ Jesus. And the moment you believe the gospel of Christ, you now have access to the genius of God, which is called omniscience. You are able to tap into the omniscience of God. Secondly, righteousness. This is righteousness that comes by faith, not by works. This is 2 Corinthians 5.21. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. And third, and, and th th so righteousness, and then sanctification. Listen, Hebrews 12.14, without sanctification, you will not know God. Without sanctification. And what is sanctification? It's being set aside through Christ, by the Holy Spirit, into union with Christ, who is seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. Sanctification. 2 Thessalonians 2.13. How? By the Holy Spirit, when you put your faith in the gospel of Christ, which sanctification is one of eight works of the Holy Spirit at the point of salvation. You say to me, Ron, I've never heard any of this. I know, because you don't go to a teaching church. If you went to a teaching church, then you would hear this. I mean, I mean, people go like, well, I've never heard that, like it's not in existence. I'm just teaching you the Bible. If you haven't heard it, you haven't been in the Bible, because there it is in the Bible. Okay? So we have wisdom of God, we have righteousness, we have sanctification, and then redemption. Ephesians 1.7, redeemed by the blood of the Lord. We sing, our Redeemer lives forever. Redemption. Those are four of the 50 things you re things that you receive in salvation that you can never lose in time and eternity. What a wonderful idea. So having read that scripture, let's have a word of prayer. Remember, the Bible. I don't know if you can appreciate the Bible. We've been teaching how you should appreciate it on Sunday. The Bible is a phenomenal book. The Bible. When Jesus came into the world, they only had half a Bible. And as a result of Christ coming into the world, the teachings on Christ presented a second part of the Bible called the New Covenant. Old Covenant, New Covenant. Now we have a Bible, a completed revelation from God to man for his existence on earth as well as heaven. Man, what a phenomenal idea that is. Nobody had that. We're the most privileged believers that have ever existed ever you live in the most phenomenal period of human history that you could ever imagine you couldn't have thrown a dart and hit it better and especially to be in America
it is no joke that it is one of the greatest nations on the face of the earth historically. No doubt about it. Not without its problems. And listen, the great thing about America, the church of Jesus Christ has kept the light on. Whoa. To all the churches of America that preach the truth of Jesus Christ. They've kept the light on in America and we've sent missionaries everywhere. Everywhere. And we send them every year. A little, this little church sponsors four. Four of missionaries from their church. Boots on the field. Doesn't inquire a lot, does it? Well, only the big church can do it. No, it's the willing church that does it. Not the big church. The willing church. Depends on what you want to spend your money on. Well, Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude type sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. How do I get out of carnality into spirituality? I confess my sin. 1 John 1, 9 says, if I confess my sin, he, is, he God, is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. You know what that forgiveness and cleanliness is? extension of the work of Christ on the cross because it deals with sin. All sin was dealt with by Christ on the cross. So when we confess our sins, it's not about salvation. It's about spirituality. It's, it's getting out of the flesh and back into the spirit who indwells our, our body and makes our body the temple of God. Who ever heard of such a thing? Nobody in the Old Testament heard that. <laughs> Common teaching in the church. The church that loves the Bible and the church that teaches a new covenant. How could you miss that 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20? What a privileged people we are to assemble like this without censorship. God bless America truly. Well, I give you a moment of silence to confess your sins through your priesthood of 1 Peter 2, 5, and 9. It's your privilege. And ask through your prayer that the Holy Spirit, as he will, teach you truth that can be applied to your life personally and shared with others through what's called ministry. The Holy Spirit will teach and recall. Well, our Father, we're thankful today for these who have come our way at lunchtime, breaking bread on Wednesday. I pray the Holy Spirit would open our hearts to the truth about God's chosen things out of the wisdom of God. The things of the wisdom of God. Why is the wisdom of God is superior to the wisdom of the world? For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we welcome you as you're eating. I suppose you have a welcomed heart. Notice we don't have a jar for you to put something in it on your way out. Because this meal has been paid for by the grace of the people that attend it. And, we, and we're appreciative of that. Bring a friend. All we're doing is studying the Bible and giving you a meal. We're feeding both parts of your, body, of your life, right? Body, well, actually three parts, body, soul, and spirit. It's up to you. We've been studying the superiority of the wisdom of God out of 1 Corinthians 1, especially strongly out of 18 through 35, which is the context of my study today. If you're looking for context, and we always are, text to context, always text to context, then we're looking at context from 1831, but actually, chapters 1 and 2 is all about the wisdom of God. It's a great study, and we're, we're certainly going to study it. In today's lesson, Paul will explain Isaiah 29, 14. Isaiah 24, 19. Look at verse 19. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. This is what 18 through 31 is all about. And he's going to get into it today because he's talking about God's chosen. God has chosen things. And that's kind of interesting to us. Uh, maybe uh, before you come back next week, you could take a look at uh, a sneak preview of where we're going. And that's chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, which picks up this subject again. I put it on your paper. Paul has contrasted 
in our study of chapter 1, Paul has contrasted the foolishness of the wisdom of the world, especially in chapter 18 through 25, our context, to the foolishness of the wisdom of God. Look at, he used the word foolish two times, one with the world and one with God. Isn't that interesting? He talks about the foolishness of God who rejects, who rejects Christ, rejects the message. Look at verse 18. The word of the cross is foolishness to the wisdom of the world. But when he gets down here into our passage, he talks about the foolishness of God. He talks about the foolishness of God. So we're going to look at three things today. The foolishness of God is wiser than men. And we're going to look at the fact that God has chosen the things out of the wisdom of the world. Point number one. It, it's kind of interesting that you might understand that verse 25 is a bridge, sent, bridge sentence idea. Now let's go back to verse 25. I, I read that a moment again. The foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. That's a bridge sentence. It's taking us out of 18 through 25 and into 2631. It's called a bridge idea. The foolishness of God. Now, he's, he's using absurdity to teach truth. Uh, the foolishness of God is wiser. This is the word sophos or sophia is wiser. And it deals with the omniscience of God. I, I don't know if you can even consider a lowest part, a lowest denominator. I suppose Jesus would have said the least in the kingdom idea. But when you're looking at the omniscience of a God, you're looking at 100%, there's always 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100% of the wisdom of God to 100% of the people, 100% of the time, yada, yada, yada. And yet he uses, what he's saying is that the lowest denominator in the, in the omniscience of God is smarter than the, the greatest wisdom of the world. God with one cylinder can do better than somebody with 12. <laughs> it's kind of the way he's doing it. It's an absurd idea to think that way. But he's saying, listen, the people in the world are foolish. The, world can, the, the wisdom of the world cannot bring you to God. It's never brought you to God. It's the wisdom of God that brings you to God. And he allows you to tap into the wisdom of God through Jesus Christ. He is the only way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Everybody go, that's a narrow gate. Of course it is. It depends on what side you're on. If you're on the divine side, it was a big gate. If you're on the man's side, it's a narrow gate. You say, well, they're like, why is that a narrow gate? God sent his only begotten son out of heaven to die on a cross so that all, all could be saved and none perish. How is that a small gate? It's only a small gate when you compare Christianity among the religions. Jesus said, you throw, throw away all those other religions. They're gods with a little g. That's demonic. You do know that, don't you? Well, you should read 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10, and Paul will teach you that. Yeah, Christianity is a narrow way. It's the only way. We're not a religion. We're a relationship orientation. In Christ, you have relationship. Without Christ, you have no relationship. Christianity is about relationship with God, where he now becomes your Abba Father, your Daddy. We call him Father on earth. We call him Daddy in heaven. Right? The, the sooner you call him Daddy on earth, he'll make, the, uh, make it... M m more common sense to you on earth. He's not just your father with a big capital, with a big capital F. He's your daddy with a little d. And you know how he did it? He is able to adopt you through the work of Christ on the cross. He was able to adopt you. You were a bastard at birth, King James Version. Don't think I'm swearing here. I'm just quoting King James out of Hebrews. 
We were all born that way. We were born illegitimate in relation to God. And he sent his son so that we could be adopted and become children of God 100%. 100%. Everybody born into the kingdom of God is 100% a son of God. He's not, he's not a half-bred. This is my half-brother, my half-sister, my half-wit. None of that. None of that. Right? We've all got one in the family, haven't we? I think I might have been the one in the family. I don't know. And so we have a bridge idea here about the foolishness of God and the weakness of God is stronger than stronger omnipotent than man. What, what a he just lays it out kind of interesting to a guy like me. Paul's point is doctrinally important to new convert new covenant believers. The lowest spiritual IQ uh, dealing with the omniscience of God is wiser than the highest human IQ regarding spiritual matters. How do I know that? <laughs> well. 1 Corinthians 2, where we're about to be, verse 14. Sneak preview. For consider your calling, brethren, saved, that there were not many. Oh, wait, wait. The natural man, unsaved, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Hello. That's what Paul said in, in, first, in the 1 Corinthians. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. We'll talk all about that when we get there. The natural man, no matter how wise he is with human IQ, is no match for the new baby believer who has just been introduced to spiritual IQ. <laughs> that says, I don't know, but I know God's my daddy. <laughs> and I'm content with that. Well, you're smarter than the smartest person in the world with all of genius and diplomas. Think about that. The baby believer in Christ is smarter than the smartest. You know how comforting that is, a pastor? Listen, here's what I know. Because we, 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 we evaluate people, even in the church, based on human IQ and not spiritual IQ. And you know what? If you've got enough sense to get saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you've got enough IQ to get saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ, you can tap into the genius of God from that day forward. Think about that. God can teach you through spiritual IQ, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit in you, truths that you could have never understood had, had, you, had you been the highest IQ ever in the human race in human IQ. No, oh, I know it's putting a lot of people out of jobs right now. All right? I make that statement. Ron, I don't see how you can make that statement. Well, I tell you, I've seen, I've seen a lot of people mentally challenged, emotionally challenged, that believe the gospel of Jesus Christ that tapped into the genius of God and were, and were absolutely brilliant in the way they approached their relationship with God. Really smart. And you probably knew some of these people. We've had some in our church. I met a lot of them when I was a rural pastor. I met a lot of them. Uneducated, couldn't read and write. that love God and their Bible and were the smartest people I ever met. They were a lot smarter than the professors I had because they had practical Christianity, not just theological Christianity. Well, anyhow, I'm just saying. You've got those experiences. They don't have to come from me. For consider your calling, Paul says in verse 26, brethren saved that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, according to the flesh. Not many noble, according to the flesh. You know why? Because they think this gospel is foolishness. Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. You've got to believe that to be saved. Oh. Oh. Oh, yeah. I sat on that dime for a whole year 
having gospel explained to me, and I went, that's stupid. Somebody dies 2,000 years ago. I should put my trust in him. 2,000 years ago. Well, he died for your sins. He was buried and he was raised from the dead. And when you die, and you will, and you're going to go someplace, and you will, you can either go to heaven or hell, where you want to go, Ron, it's up to you. If you believe Christ, if you believe the gospel, you're going to be with him. He's in heaven. Seated at the right hand of God the Father. The half of the book will teach you that. Read the half book, the last half book, half the book, read it. But it's your choice. And, and listen, I didn't understand it to believe it. I thought I had to understand it and believe it to get it. You know what I mean? I had to understand it. You don't. You believe it and then you understand it. Because the Holy Spirit comes and he teaches it to you. It's a gift. Spiritual IQ is a gift. You're not born with it. Born with it. You're not born with it. You're born again with it. <laughs> I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Just read it for yourself. Point number two. In verse 26, Paul used a second bridge idea. He's, he, listen, I'm trying to teach you, Paul does a lot of bridge idea guy, things. He, 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 he talks about something, he builds a bridge, and takes you to a, another point. Good communicators do that. You do, you do know that. You could make a debate team if you couldn't do that. Paul used 126 as a second bridge idea to explain three categories of achievement of the wisdom of the world. What Paul called according to the flesh. The unsaved. He used a brief sentence. Not many wise, not many mighty, not many noble. Not many. Not many in the kingdom. Why? They're too smart for their britches, my grandmother used to say. Just too smart for the britches. I think that's what Paul would say. Paul was teaching that the best of the foolishness of the wisdom of the world pales when comparing them to the least of the wisdom of God. Paul shows the superiority of the wisdom of God by using a special phrase now in verses 27 through 28. God has chosen. He uses it three times. You always look for that. What do I call that? Markers. I call them study markers. If, 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 if we were in a class and we actually gave you tests, I would, you would see God has chosen you in my class would have been on your test. <laughs> of course, I don't give them, so. God does, though. <laughs> so I don't have to spend all my time giving tests. As he gives them. Now watch 1, 2, 3. In verse 27. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. That's what he had to do with me. Number two. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. For example, that would be, you could find this like, what, what do you mean by that, Ron? Well, I mean like, like 118 and 23, where the word of the cross is foolishness to the wisdom of the world. You could look at 23 and 24, where the preaching of the message of the gospel is foolishness. Listen, I knew that going in. Because I found it to be true in my life. When, I was, when Paul said that this is a standard, I went, well, geez, I was just a normal unbeliever. I thought I was kind of unique and everything because most of the people that I knew grew up religiously. I didn't, but most of the people I knew in the South grew up religiously. I mean, just about everybody I met had somebody in their family that was a preacher. I didn't know anybody in the North who had family preacher. That was the last thing anybody wanted to do 
that, that came after car salesmen and insurance salesmen was preachers in the north. If you couldn't make it in those three, I mean, if you couldn't make it as the first two, you wound up, that, that's the way my people thought. I think they still think that. But I don't know. What do I know? God has chosen the weak things, he says, of the world. In verse 20, look at verse 20. He says, here's what he's talking about. He says, where is the, where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debaters of the age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? Rick Hughes and I back when everybody was on the college campuses protesting the Vietnam War. We thought that was a great, a great opportunity to mix and mingle in there and preach the gospel. So we hit all these co co colleges, Kent State, Michigan, all these, all these big schools. We hit them. We hit them. We would go in there and we'd debate with them. We'd go in there and debate with them by preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. They'd bring out their big guns. They'd bring out professors. And we'd just preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. And we got more people saved. That's how you get people saved, you know. You just preach the gospel. And those who are open to it will believe. And those who aren't, it's okay. I sowed the seed. And we picked up Mike Vines and away we went. The three of us, we worked these college campuses. We'd go back in the summer and work the beaches up in Michigan. We worked the beaches one whole summer in Michigan. What am I trying to tell you? I'm trying to tell you that, listen, of course people are crazy out in the world. Where are the, listen, and this was our key passages. Where's the wise man? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of the age? They don't, they don't stand a chance with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just don't get off your message. Stay on your message. Don't get off and debate what they want to debate. Stay on it. Listen, if you'll accept Christ, we would tell the kids, all this stuff will get cleared up. All this stuff that you're nuts over can be solved before the end of the day by accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because we believed you could tap into the genius of God, something they couldn't in all the something they couldn't in all the protesting of their life, they could never get it. One moment of believing the gospel of Jesus Christ as a baby believer, they're tapped into the wisdom of God, and in the wisdom of God, He shows you the foolishness of the world. The foolishness of the world. I mean, that was like taking candy from a baby. People go, I can't believe you could go on those campuses and they're right and everything. It's like taking candy from a baby. Because of the power of God. I mean, how are you living your life? You live in it in fear and you live in it in all the chaotic stuff of the world. The world's a chaos place. You don't have to go to the moon to find chaos. Just go next door. What brings order in the world is God. 1 Corinthians 14, 33. God is a God of order. You're not going to find order in your marriage, in your family, in your church, in your community. You bring God and you bring him boldly. That's what changed me. It wasn't weak Christians, it was strong Christians. By that I mean people who would not budge on the gospel. I'd accept it about any way except the way of the cross. Well, I don't know. Anyhow. Now listen what he says. God has chosen, point number two, the second, God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. Now watch what he says. Because you'll never, I don't even know what your Bible says, but you'll never know. It, 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 Paul said, the English it says, and the base things of the world and the despised. Now, do you have any clue what the base things of the world are? <laughs> I know you don't. I mean, first base, second base, third base, fourth base, what, what base are we talking about? 
army base? <laughs> it's the word A G E N E S. That A on the front is an alpha privative. It means without. And the other is the word genes. And listen, what the, what the, what it what it's really talking about is what Paul said in verse 26 when he said, there's not many wise, not many mighty, and not many noble. Uh, b listen, listen. B born into privilege. You ever heard that? And you wonder, born with a silver spoon, right? That's what I heard as a kid. The rest of us, I mean, th these were people that had the chance of a lifetime, never took it. They squandered it away. Right? The others didn't. They took advantage of it. These are the world's wise, mighty, and noble. They took advantage of it. So who do you think the despised are? <laughs> Well, look in your own family book. The one, the most despised are the ones that could have, should have, would have, didn't. But you see, that's the world views everybody. And here are the despised. This word for despised is an interesting, it's a perfect passive participle for those who know the, see, he's talking about the base things of the world, those of privilege, those who had the opportunities and the privileges. We live in America. Who, listen, who couldn't get an education? You know how I got an education? I worked. Went to school and worked. When I, got, you know, when I graduated, I had no debt. You know why? Because it took me longer to get through. I was an old man by the time I got through. Most, listen, when I walked around the campus working on my theology degree, people thought I was a professor because of my age. And I dressed that way. I dressed that way because I was pastor in a small church and I had to make hospital calls. When I got through school, I had to go, I had to make I had to make hospital calls before I got home. And all all other kinds of things. We live in America. What a wonderful place. If you it, listen, you, you understand why ambitious people from all over the world are clamoring to get here? Quit that freeloading stuff. If you want it, go get it. This is America. Little little country boy from Podunk, nowhere. I was told in the sixth grade, do you want to go to college? I went home and said, I'm going to college. They said, no, we can't afford to send you to college. I went back disappointed and told my sixth grade teacher, they said, I can't go to college. They said, Ron Adelman, you can send yourself to college. You don't need anybody. I said, how is that possible? She said, Pick up your grades to A's and B's, and when you go to high school, keep them A's and B's. I promise you, we'll get you into a college. And was she ever right? I bought into her, Phyllis Breening. I bought into that. I picked my grades from a D.C. average guy. What do I care? I picked my grades immediately up, and buddy, I was on, I was on the way. It's America. God bless America. This is America. I didn't do all that because I was a believer. I was an American. I had great opportunities. The only thing that held me back was me. I had a wonderful family that supported me, but anyhow, they're despised. That's the bottom of the ring. Here you got the top of the ring of the wisdom of the world. They got the elites, and then they got the despised. Those who, who can't, won't, or shouldn't, they're despised. Despised by those who have, the have-nots are despised. That's the wisdom of the world. That's the way the world works. You want, you want out? Come on over to the kingdom. Believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. Come on in. Water's good. Come on in. All you got to do is believe. Believe they died for your sins that separates you from God, was buried and raised from the dead to give you life everlasting. Come on in. <laughs> Jeez.
How wonderful God is. How wonderful God is. How wonderful God is. I know all you know that. I guess I'm talking to the internet. I used to say I don't know who I'm talking to because all of you know it. Now I got the internet, so I blame them. Well, I must be talking to you, buddy. In Taiwan somewhere. I'm talking to somebody. Watch the third thing he says is really interesting. Not that the others weren't. God has chosen the things that are not. <laughs> I love this. You see the word for are is aimi. The Greeks created a wonderful word here by God. It is the word aimi. It's the word is and is called in the Greek language is called an absolute status quo verb of existence. I is. I is alive. This, listen, this is when God, this, listen, this comes right out of the Old Covenant. When God says, I am that I am, in the Greek that would be I me. In the Hebrew, they had, a, they had it in Hebrew, it was called Hayah, Hayah. And it, 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 haya would be translated by the Greek into aimi. They both were absolute status quo verbs of existence. God says to Abraham, who goes like, well, I'm 100. What do you expect from me? A baby? <laughs> and Sarah says, where were you 20, 30, 40 years ago when it might have been sensible for me to have a baby? I'm 90 years old. You know what he told him? I am God. I can call into existence that which does not exist. You know what that is in Hebrew? Bara. When you read Genesis and what... That's our next book. When, when you read Genesis and it says he created, bara, it means to create something out of nothing. We, 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 listen, it takes our breath away when he creates out of something created. He takes, look, well, let me show you. He takes, he creates the earth. He takes a clump of dirt, creates man, how about it, girls? A dirt bag. He, he takes a dirt bag and turns it into a man. And then he breathes Nisha Mahaim into it. And he becomes a living soul. But listen. He created the rest. out. Listen. He created the earth out of nothing. In the beginning was God. And God is everything. <laughs> If you, got, if you got God, you got everything. If you ain't got God, you ain't got nothing. But when you have God, he can, in your life, he can create something out of nothing. Abraham and Sarah said, we, we, are, we were barren, and now we've gone through menopause. For what reason, I don't know, because I didn't have any luck on the other side of it. And now on this side of it, you say, we're going to do it. I don't think so. And she laughed, right? I don't know. She had the tent laugh and <coughs> probably a cough. I would have with all that dust. And... What time have I got? Is it time to quit? Okay, let me finish. Let me finish. Listen, listen. God has chosen things which are not. That, Hena plus the subjunctive of divine purpose, with a divine purpose that he, God, who has chosen, might nullify, abolish, render inactive the things that are. What a wonderful idea. He does that in your life. Do you know that? Oh, I've got some wonderful plans. 
Well, have you talked it over with God? No, I don't need to talk about this with God. No, you need to talk everything over with God. No, I tell you, I've got this one. I've, I've got it. I'm a smart guy. I know how to work the world. I'm, I'm okay. I, I tell you, I think you ought to talk over with the Lord because the wisdom of the world is stupidity. I don't know. You think you got some? You got some coaster areas of your life? Well, you know, I think I can coast through on this one. I don't think you should. You can if you want to, because it's going to be a bumpy ride. I don't know what coasting is going to be without God. It ain't going to be a good one. Why don't you talk with everything over with God? That's that's what that's what Paul is suggesting. What are the things chosen by God that are not part of the wisdom of the world? That are only part of the wisdom of God? Well, he tells you. Four things, wisdom of God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. That's just four or 50, by the way. But that's quite a bit, isn't it? And you know why? Look at verse 30 and 31. Let's go look at that, and then I'm going to close. Look at, look at 30, 31. I love this. No, I love it all, don't I? I don't know how many times I've told you today. <laughs> I just love the Bible. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to, the, became to us the wisdom of God, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. Look at verse 29. No man should boast before God. So what was his so solution? Verse 30 was his solution. Right? No man. Listen. Verse 28. The base things of the world and the despised. God has chosen these the things that are not, that he might... Nullify the things that are, that no man should boast before God. And then he talks about the wisdom of God, the righteousness, and the sanctification and redemption that comes through Jesus Christ, who those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 31. That just as it is written, Jeremiah 9.23. Got a study Bible? Look in your cross-reference. Jeremiah 9.23 there. See, you always want to know where that's coming from. You think Jeremiah is right in good times or bad times? Is he living in the good good old days or the tough days? Jeremiah is right. In the, I mean, they sunk him in a well up to his neck and let the rats have at it. And you know what God did? God protected him. Don't forget that. When you're up to your neck and something. Don't forget that. For just as it is written, let, wait a minute. <coughs> oh, excuse me. That tent, that tent got to me. Just as it is written, let him who boasts, watch this, boast what, how? In the Lord. Because nobody can, bo nobody's going to stand before them and blo boast about anything they did in life, whether wide, scribe, blah, 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 blah. none of that. But listen, you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're going to stand for, for before God and you're going to boast in the Lord. Huh? And if he gives you enough time to talk, you'll boast about a whole lot of things in the Lord, won't you? But it'd be enough just to stand there and boast that you're there because of the Lord. Well, thanks for coming. I appreciate you saying something. Listen, there's a little passage, some, maybe tonight before you go to bed or tomorrow when you get up and drink your coffee and you do your quiet time. You ought to read 2 Corinthians 10, 16 and 17, where it used boast in the Lord again. Another reference to Jeremiah 9, 23. Uh, be good reading for you. Well, thanks for coming. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way by the automobile and the Internet. Pray the Holy Spirit would take the truth out of this lesson, apply it to our life, Father, both in, in manifesting our spiritual growth, edifying us, Father, within our, our temple, and then, Father, bring it into understanding where we could share the truth with others that they might be set free. Like Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. God is so good to be set free in time and eternity.